I'm telling you, it was such an amazing week watching these people. And, you know, we had over 185 kids all introduced to Jesus in a way that's fun, exciting, where, where it's great to be a God follower. And uh, Betsy and Leslie, first time ever running Vacation Bible School, they're a first year team, and uh, they absolutely crush it, right? <laughs> absolutely crush it. I am so, so uber proud of them. That's fantastic. All right, well, hey, we are in this series called Love Does, and I got a quick question for you, all right? All right, how many of you have a bumper sticker on your car, all right? So raise your hand if you have a bumper sticker on your car, all right? Okay, for one, you should all be going out to the information table and getting a Canyon Springs bumper sticker. Thank you very much. Um, but you, you're not really bumper sticker people, are you? Okay, but how many of you like reading them? Okay, right, right. So I'm with you. I don't have a bunch of bumper stickers. Then you drive by and you see that creepy person with 100 bumper stickers that you never want to, you don't ever want to, park next to that guy, right? You, you don't. But I love reading them, you know, maybe, maybe even dangerously so, you know, as I'm driving, trying to get. Now, I have a couple of my favorites. We're going to start off with some of my favorites. Here's one of my favorites. Ready? Okay, that's not it. Here we go. Please don't hit me. I'm not 100% sure about my coverage. <laughs> I thought that was a great one. Here's, here's another one. Honk if you're Amish. <laughs> it took a while. This group got it before that group. <laughs> you see, they can't drive. You understand? Okay. All right. You got it. Okay, good. Good, good. You got it. Okay, next. I lo- <laughs> we ate your stick, family. How many of you think this is completely inappropriate for church? All right. Welcome to Canyon Springs. Must be your first time. <laughs> okay. How about this one? Uh, very funny, Scotty. Now beam down my clothes. <laughs> Star Trek fans, all right. I thought you geeks might enjoy that one. Okay, next one. All right, how many of you seen this? You guys ever seen this? Anybody, uh, uh, honestly, does anybody have this on their car? Do we have anybody who's got this on their car? Anybody have this tattooed on their body someplace? <laughs> Probably, this is, those are the kind of people we're talking about. I don't know, I couldn't put that on my car because I haven't finished a marathon, but I'm thinking about putting this one on my car. 26.2 Oreos I can eat in one sitting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, if you like that one, you're going to love this one. I like this one even better. Here we go. 0.262. <laughs> That's quality, don't you think? <laughs> so, so there. <laughs> All right, but I'm not really a bumper sticker person. I'd be more likely to put this on my bumper right here. On the advice of my lawyer, my bumper has no comment at this time. (laughs) That would be that would be more me. Now I used to. I do run. I don't run uh, marathons, but I run. And I had this little route. I used to run this specific little route around my neighborhood. And every time I would go, I would see a car, and on that car it had a bumper sticker. And every time I saw that particular bumper sticker, I had all these emotions. And some of them were sadness. Uh, Some of them, I I guess I felt maybe more brokenhearted than anything. As I looked at that bumper sticker, I realized there's a lot of history to this particular bumper sticker. And it read like this. Ready? I've got nothing against God. It's his fan club I can't stand. Now, I'm sure there's lots of different feelings that people have. Some people probably, maybe they're offended. You know, you're Christian people. Why are you judging me like that? My feeling was hurt. Because I'm thinking to myself, what happened? Maybe this person grew up in a family where there was no grace. There was only judgment. And it was all about follow this rule, follow that rule, do this, don't do that. The God's just got his list up in heaven and he's checking it off. Or maybe they knew some people that, that were Christian. At least that was what they were on Sunday. And yet every other aspect of their life, you, there's no way you could tell the difference. Maybe it was television that they watched and they saw somebody get up on TV and they, all they preached was that if you love God, you'll have more money and give money to us and then they drive off in their nice car. And I thought, wow, that feels hypocritical to me. 
But there's a history to that bumper sticker. And it always makes me sad when I run by it. Now, a couple of thoughts I had when I saw that bumper sticker. One, there's a history. Two, this idea popped into my head just by the fact that I call myself a God follower. I will face opposition. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the, the fact that if you try to do something good, change your life, make a difference, try something great, you know, try some amazing adventure, take a big risk. If you do that, somebody somewhere thinks you're doing it wrong and will criticize you. Well, let me add this to it. If you try to do something great and you try to do it in the name of God, you just double that criticism. You guys want to see my very least favorite Bible promise? All right, you ready for it? Here we go, right here. Jesus said it himself. Boom. Mellow. Yeah, did you see it? No, that's not it. How about if I read it to you? There we go. John 16, 33 says this. In this world, you will have trouble. There's your promise. Do I hear an amen? Amen. I'm so glad that Jesus continued, but take heart, I've overcome the world. But I just got to tell you, you're going to face opposition. It's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. You're going to have people that criticize you, people that think that you can't do it. And all kinds of different areas of your life. My guess is, as you walked in here today, some of you are carrying that opposition. Some of it looks like family opposition. Your marriage is struggling, and you as people are like this. Maybe it's children opposition. And you have this lovely, beautiful little child that you were everything to them and then they turned 13. <laughs> yeah, somebody's living it. <laughs> Some of you feel that way at work too. You want to do your job, you want to do it well and you're facing opposition as you do your work. So here's what our challenge is today. We're going to look into the book of Nehemiah. We've been in the series called Love Does because love doesn't just talk about it. Love doesn't just say, hey, I'll pray for you. Love goes and buys chicken soup and delivers it. Love brings over a gift card. Love goes downtown and feeds a homeless person. Love goes over to Mexico and runs vacation Bible school. Love does. They get involved. They don't just talk about it. They do it. And there's one guy in the Bible, and his name is Nehemiah, and he knew what it was all about. He knew that love does. And that's the guy we're looking at today. Now, he did this amazing, great work. If you haven't been here, let me recap. The walls of Jerusalem had fallen down. They'd been down for 140 years. He had this idea, I'd like to rebuild those walls. It broke his heart to know that. So he went before the king. It could have cost him his life to go before the king. He did it anyway. Not only did his king give the approval, gave him all the supplies he needed. He's on his way. They start building the wall. And guess what happens? Any guesses? Opposition. So here's how we're going to start. Why don't you bow your head? And we'll just take a moment. And I want you to think right now, what is my opposition? Where am I feeling opposed? Maybe, maybe what's my battle right now? So I just, if you're in one of those right now, I want you to pray this. Say, dear God, meet me in my opposition today. Meet me in my opposition. Just take a moment, pray that. Lord God, I pray that you'd meet us here today. I pray that we'd be able to listen to you. Lord God, I pray your blessing on these people. Um, If they're opposed as a principal, if they're opposed as a husband or a wife or at work, I pray, God, that you would pour into their life and that you would give them the encouragement that they need and just the wisdom to make it through. We love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you've got a Bible, open it up to Nehemiah chapter 4. You can look at it up on your phone or your tablet, whatever. If you want to find it, find the book of Psalms, go four chapters back towards the beginning. 
or four books back towards the beginning, you'll find the book of Nehemiah. We're in chapter four. They've already started building the wall back up in chapter three. Opposition comes, chapter four, verse one. As we look at Nehemiah, we're going to find that opposition hits us in a lot of different ways. And if we're going to love people, we need to love through opposition. We're going to find three different ways that we can do that. First, we're going to find is this. We can love through opposition only by being ready for it. You gotta be ready. You gotta know it's coming. Uh, you have to know that if you're trying something great, you're doing something for God, trying to love somebody, trying to be in a marriage, trying to raise kids, you're gonna face opposition. It's just part of it. And you're gonna get it from three different angles. And the first angle is outside. You get opposition from the outside looking in. Look at verse one. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry. He was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, he joined in. He was at his side. He said, what are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Opposition, criticism in their face. Now let me help you understand why Sanballat was so opposed to them building the walls. The Jewish people had a city of Jerusalem, which was, the, it was really the, the center of their, not only their life, but of their worship of God. So this was really important to them. Well, the Samaritans and the Jewish people hated each other because the Samaritans used to be Jewish people and then they intermarried and they went off their own way. They turned their backs on God and they went their own way. Okay, so let me help you understand. This is like Raider fan, Charger fan here, okay? This is Red Sox, Yankees, Dodgers, Padres, whatever you like. They did not like each other. And really what I think at the bottom of this is that they felt threatened. The walls are being rebuilt. Maybe these people are going to rise up. Maybe they're going to threaten us. And I want you to understand something. If you're being criticized, a lot of times is why. People are threatened by you. And you don't think of it like that. You think, why would anybody ever be threatened by me? But people are threatened by the stupidest things. You know, you go back to, you, know, you want to go back and get your degree. And people, are, people will make fun of you and they'll mock you. They'll go, wow, it's just a waste of time. Why are you going back? You know what they're feeling? They're threatened. Because they didn't go back and get their degree. So why do you need to get your degree? You make a big decision. You say, you know what? I'm going to stand up for God and I'm going to be pure sexually. I'm going to be pure sexually in, in high school and college. Let me tell you something. You want to be ridiculed? That'll do it. Try this. I'm not going to drink anymore. I realize that it's got too much of a grip on my life. I'm not going to drink anymore. Man, you get in the right group of people and they will light you up. Because they're threatened, because they feel like maybe they're drinking too much or maybe they made some mistakes in their past and if you do the right thing, they're going to look bad. That's just life. When you try to do something great, you'll face outside opposition. You'll also face inside opposition. Sometimes this hurts even more. I mean, you can't understand it from people that aren't in your circle, but when people that are in your circle start to criticize, that can be scarring. I had a scarring event happen to me this last week, and it happened from the inside. Let me explain. There's a staff person. I'm going to call her out right here. All right, so Betsy is running her first vacation Bible school, and I said, Betsy, is there anything I can do to help? Yeah, you can actually greet at the front gate. Okay, I'd be happy to greet at the front gate. In fact, Betsy, I will wear whatever you want me to wear at the front gate. You want to see what that looked like? You ready? Drop the lights. Roll the video. scarring. In fact, I don't think I was the only one scarred. There were some little kids that wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> and one of them, I thought, you know, maybe if I go up and hug him, that was not the right answer. <laughs> They're not at church today. 
Hey, look with me at verse 4. It says this, uh, uh, Nehemiah prays, it says, Hear us, O God, we're despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Don't cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. And the people worked with all their heart. Uh, Keep reading, verse 7. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashad heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were angry. They plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble We can't rebuild the wall. I think Nehemiah gets it when it's Sanballat and Tobiah and people on the outside. But all of a sudden, after all this criticism, this is what his own people say. There's so much rubble. I don't think we can do it. I don't think it's going to happen. Do you notice when it happened to? The walls were halfway. I don't know if you've ever tried to do anything great. Halfway is maybe the most difficult spot. At the beginning, you're all in. Hey, let's do this. This It's great. Halfway, insults, hard work, you're exhausted. Halfway is the time a lot of people give up. Let me give you an example. You ever try to clean your garage? Oh, man, halfway is the worst. You know, I'll tell you something even worse than cleaning your garage. Cleaning my mother's garage. Uh, several years ago, she moved into a retirement community, so we had to rent the house and we had to clean out her garage. We found that when we cleaned out her garage, there was an army of rats living in it. Not just rats, possums as well. She had possums in her garage. You know, you guys know me, I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac. I'm not only worried about finishing this job at this point, I'm thinking I am going home with some kind of black plague from cleaning out her garage. Listen, you you try something great. You try to make a difference. You try to start, you know, a a homeless ministry or you try to reach out to your neighbor or you try to make a difference at your work. Halfway is tough. It's especially tough when people on the inside start grumbling. I think this is more dangerous though. I have one last and that's internal opposition. These are the criticisms he's getting. What are these feeble Jews doing? What what are they building? If even a fox climbed on it, he'd break down the walls of stone. Those are the kinds of words that when you hear, they start to repeat as audio files in your head. I wonder if you know what I'm talking about. I wonder if there are any of you that have audio files that you heard when you were a kid that your parents said. And when you face that opposition, Inside, all of a sudden, you start, they start going, right? Maybe I can't do it. Maybe I am just a quitter. Maybe I'm just not able. You remember what your boss said. Maybe I'm not a leader. Maybe I'm not good enough. And that internal pressure starts building. I need you to understand this. If you attempt something great, you'll face opposition. And you need to know it on the front end. No matter what great thing it is you try, there will be opposition. And one of the ways to overcome that is simply by knowing it's coming. All right? Let me give you another. We're going to keep looking into Nehemiah's life. Secondly, we can love through opposition by evaluating and responding to criticism. Um, there's a right way, wrong way to respond to criticism. There's good criticism, bad criticism. We need to know, we need to be able to discern the difference. But, you know, like I said, you'll always get criticism. Let me read you some. I I got a kick out of these. This is from uh, Forest Service employees. There are surveys that you can do when you go to a national park. And people will fill out these forms. These were some of the criticisms of the national parks in our United States. You ready? Okay. The places where trails do not exist are not well marked. Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. (laughs) Okay, only downhill. Only downhill. 
Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness <laughs> to rid the area of these pests. Okay, this one takes some thought. This might hit you a little bit later. Need more signs to inform the people to keep the area pristine. <laughs> get it? It's not pristine if there's signs. Okay. Maybe on the way home. You'll get that on the way home. Uh, you'll get this one. A McDonald's would be nice at the trailhead. <laughs> Last one. We're all in on this one, I think. Chair lifts need to be in some places so we, so we can get the wonderful views without having to hike to them. Do I hear an amen on that one? <laughs> you know, if all of our criticism was like that, we could rumple it up and we could throw it in the trash can. But you know, Christmas not all like that. Some of it is good for us. In fact, the Bible says more about listening to criticism than discarding criticism. I have some verses. Here we go. If you listen to constructive criticism, you'll be home among the wise. That's big. Secondly, to the one who listens, valid criticism is like a gold earring or other gold jewelry. Okay, last one. This one you should get. Whoever stubbornly refuses to accept criticism will be suddenly destroyed beyond recovery, okay? Is it getting through to you now? Look, we can't just throw it all out, can we? Some of the ways that we have grown the best and deepest are because that people have said, don't go this way, go that way. Don't do it this way, do it this way. So how do we navigate these waters you give you a couple ways. First step to handling criticism is always prayer, or at least that's what Nehemiah did. If you look, check out what he prays. He says, hear us, O God, for we're despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over to plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. I'd love that. I'd love to pray that against the people who don't like me. You know, may their insults go on their head. Dear Jesus, get them. That's what this prayer is. Um, I know that prayer sounds maybe a little bit brutal, but listen, Nehemiah is just being real. He's being authentic. He's saying to God, this is how I feel. I want you to understand that you can do that with our God. You can pray those things that you feel. Okay, secondly, don't waste time on unwarranted criticism. We talked about that a second ago. There's some criticism that is unnecessary. And yet we let it repeat in tapes in our head. It's the kind of thing that goes through your mind as you go to bed at night. And we got to get rid of that. And lastly, love takes valid criticism seriously. So people are attacking, they're criticizing, they're, they're saying that the walls can't be built, and then they take it to this violent level. And so Nehemiah, he's got to step up. Um, let me look with me at verse 8. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem, stir up trouble against it, but we prayed to our God. Love this. We prayed and we posted a guard. Um, he heard their criticism. He heard their fear. He posted a guard. Verse 13, Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. Now look at verse 16. From that day on, half my men did the work, while well, the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all of the people of Judah. He did a couple of things. It's halfway. They're tired. They're under attack. So we put some of them waiting with weapons, and the rest of them went to work. So now these people are only working half the time. He listened to their needs. He valued them. He saw life from their perspective. I think we would all like to think of ourselves like that, that we see life from the people around us' perspective. But do we? I have a little object lesson. Oh, here it is. I want to show you right here. Okay. If you wander around Disneyland or the fair, you're going to find something like this, right? You're going to see one of these. And if you see one of these sometime, I'm sure you've all experienced this. You're at an amusement park, and there's a little kid, and he's, got, he's so happy, and then this happens. 
oh no, and you can just see the tears. And I, I'm not going to lose it because I needed it for both services, so I made a really long cord. <laughs> but there it goes. Now, if you, who's seen that happen? Who's seen that happen? What's a parent response when that happens? Parent, typical parent response is, oh, don't worry about it. It's just a balloon. We can get you another balloon. Uh, any of you fans of Brian Regan? I know you are, Trev. Brian Regan? Brian Regan made this comment. He's a comedian and he said this. How insensitive we are when we say to a child, it's we can get another balloon. Well, what if it was your wallet that was floating away? Ah! Oh, don't worry about it, Dad. We can get another wallet. But we don't look at life like that, do we? It's just a balloon. It's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Because it's not a big deal to me, it shouldn't be a big deal to you. That's not what God wants from us. He wants to understand, to see things from people's perspective. This isn't just with kids either. All right? Some of you ladies are married to a guy that never wants to go to the party. Right? Do I hear an amen here? You love people. And he has a very strong feeling about people. And you know what it is? He does not like people. He hates people. He would rather never be with people. And so your attitude is, hey, it's just a party. Get over it. Amen. You know? <laughs> okay, we got a guy in trouble right here. Just hang out by the food. Let me go have some fun. Listen. We need to understand life from each other's perspective because in one family there's a party person and in the same family there's a person who wants to just be home. And sometimes the person who wants to just be home needs to see life from their perspective and go to the party. And other times the person that loves the party needs to stay home and be with his spouse. And see life from your, each other's perspective and then respond appropriately. Okay. I got one last way that we can overcome opposition. And that's this. We can love through opposition by remembering all that God's done already. Look at these verses, Nehemiah 4.14. After I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who's great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your home. If you have a highlighter or a pen, underline this line. Remember, here's something we all need to work on. Remember. God has done great things in all of our lives, right? You can probably make a big old list of all the great things that God has done in your life. And about 10 minutes after he's done them, we're on to the next worry and the next fear. We forget all of the great things he's done. And Nehemiah says, look, for us to even be here is a miracle. The king let me go. He didn't kill me. He gave us all kinds of supplies. We gathered all these people. We're already halfway done. Remember, remember that the Lord is great and awesome. And in this situation where you're facing opposition, with your child, with your spouse, at work, it's the same God. He's great, he's awesome, he's capable, and he'll help you overcome it. He can do it. Remember that this is the kind of God we serve, the one that does amazing things. So we're going to end this service like we ended last week's service. I'm going to bring up Eric Brink. Uh, in just a second, Eric is a surgeon, and he went to Belize with 36 of his closest friends. It was really nice and comfortable there, I'm sure. And we've been telling this story. We told, started telling this last week that a friend of ours, uh, Tiffany, also went on that trip. And Tiffany is a nurse. And Tiffany had this great, brilliant idea that she was going to bring ostomy supplies. Eric, tell them again what ostomy supplies are. Okay, I apologize. You guys are seeing a lot of me. Um, <laughs> ostomy supplies. So we have a lady that uh, was in, in Belize, had a routine procedure, and had an injury to her bowel. Uh, unfortunately, they tried to do damage control surgery, and they brought the bowel out through the skin, and it's, an ostomy is where they put a bag over that. Okay, so we're going to let... 
Tiffany tell her part of the story right now. This is Tiffany from Belize. We have a little video we want you to watch. Ready? Hi, I'm Tiffany, and this is my first Belize, my first mission trip. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be asked to come along to be the nurse, and I thought I was just going to provide some first aid and that type of thing to the group. Before I left, I had asked some colleagues for some supplies, and I was offered some uh, supplies for ostomy patients. Wasn't quite sure if we'd need them, but I thought, hey, what the heck, Let's, I'll take them along. So I was able to bring along a couple thousand dollars with the ostomy supplies, thinking I probably would not even meet a patient that would need this kind of stuff. Um, anyway, when, once we got to the village, I was able to provide a lot of care for these wonderful people, um, went to their homes and uh, provided education and first aid to them. But I also found out that right down the street from where we were staying was a patient that needed these supplies. She was a colostomy patient, a very complicated patient with a, a colostomy. And for her to get these supplies, it was cost hundreds of dollars and she has to go to another country to get these supplies. So I was able to give them to her, and I feel like that was definitely not a coincidence. That was definitely God's work, and um, I just was so thankful that we could help her and her family and so many other people in the village. So that's my experience in Belize. So, <clears throat> so it starts with Tiffany going to Belize, saying, hey, I have all these awesome supplies. How many mission trips have we been on, 30-plus mission trips, Canyon Springs in the last five, six years? How many ostomy patients have we met? None, ever. And Eric's going, why are we bringing out? She even told her, don't bring them, right? I did. That's yeah. right, that's right. Oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> and we found, you found this woman, right? Yeah, so her name's Vilma. Uh, she's in the middle of the jungle of Belize. Um, she has... Uh, very bad procedure, um, and basically her ostomy is not functioning because uh, the bowel is actually, through a series of multiple damage control surgeries, she's leaking her abdominal contents out of the scar, the midline scar, and her ostomy is not working, and she's got yeah. burns and everything else from this. It's not a survivable condition. Right, right. So... Last week, Eric came up and told us about this. Your specialty is what? Yeah, so I'm an acute care emergency and trauma surgeon. Uh, it's what I do. I'm a full-time Navy surgeon, and I also do trauma uh, at the local hospitals in the area. But my niche is actually abdominal wall reconstruction. We're talking about building walls right now. Think about the parallels there. But <laughs> abdominal wall reconstruction, and my specialty is what we call the ab abdominal catastrophe Somebody messed it up, you fix it. Yes. That's right. Now, kind of expensive procedure, would you say? Uh, yes. Um, there's multiple factors that make this a very expensive procedure. One, it's $150 a minute in an OR. So for an eight-hour surgery, you're looking at almost a $60,000 case. Not to mention the supplies that we need to rebuild the abdomen, which is, uh, in her case, I can't just use, we use what's called a mesh. It's kind of a material made out of uh, uh, Gore-Tex, like your coat is, that we sew into place that kind of reconstructs the abdominal wall. In her case, I can't use that because it would get infected because of all the abdominal spillage. So what I have to have, should I just go ahead and go for it? Just let them know. Let the cat out of the bag. So one of my biggest hurdles in this whole case was finding the correct mesh. She actually has to have what's called a bio mesh. Very, very expensive. Uh, it's created from human cadavers, but it is made specifically for this case. Um, last Sunday after talking to you, I had a $26,000 mesh given to me for this purpose um, for this particular lady. And then throughout the week, all the staplers and everything that I need for the surgery supply-wise has been donated to me. So I have well over $50,000 in supplies ready. Since last time we talked on Sunday, Six, sixty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars. That's it. Amazing. I didn't know this until Eric came up for service. Um, not everybody's supportive. Yeah. So the, as we're talking about some of the internal and external, uh, you know, um, f people who are kind of casting doubts on this whole thing. Of course, my colleagues uh, at the hospitals are. You know, one of them, quote unquote, said. 
G, poisonous snakes, lots of mosquitoes, rain, and the most complicated abdomen you can find in the world. Sounds great. Have fun with that. Uh, but that is the overall mentality of a lot of the, uh, the, my colleagues. You know, why would, why would somebody do this? Um, but, I mean, it's a calling. God has put me here doing this for this specific purpose. I'm sure of it. That's right. Listen, you will face opposition. Do it anyway. You try to make a difference in the lives of people, you will have people tell you you are doing it wrong. Do it anyway. It's what God calls us to do. And the fact that you're a believer doesn't help. It just makes it harder. Do it anyway. Because these are the stories that change the world. This is the God that we serve. So I want to read this to you. All right? Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome and fight for your brothers. Let me read it to you one more time in your family, with your kids, at your work. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. That's my challenge for you today. So, Eric, would you mind, can you pray for us? Pray, you know, as uh, we're going to join him. He's still got lots of hurdles, right? Um, uh, pretty soon, you're just going to take over speaking on Sunday. So that's going to be one of your, another <laughs> no, one of I your promise. hurdles. No, I <laughs> promise. So why don't you pray, and then I will close for us. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning um, kind of in the mil middle of building walls. You know, it's not the finished product, but... Uh, the way you open doors, the way you bless us, the way you give us a calling on our heart. I'm not the only one. There's other people out here who are building walls as well and are called to great things. This church is so active. God, we just want to pray your blessing on all of those, those cases uh, in everyone where they're at right now and meeting opposition, both internal and external. God, help us to have the strength to continue to carry on. As far as you open the doors, let us walk through them. And I pray for those people who don't have their wall but are searching. God, I just pray that you put a calling on their heart and help us all to stay strong, especially when we're in the middle of building this wall. Help us to stay strong. Help us to be diligent. Give us the strength, the trust, the faith that you give to us in these projects. And God, we just want you to be praised in all of this. You, you are the reason that we do this, and we're so thankful to you. And God, we just ask you to continue to bless us. And it's in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks, Eric. All right, that's the God we serve. Hey, we're going to have our band come down. Come on, Ben. Great job. Thank you. Kyle is off at the houseboat trip. Yeah, shocking that he volunteered for that uh, difficult labor. Um, but you guys are doing a great job.